Well, uh, greetings, Grace Church. <laughs> My name is Dan Arcilla, and uh, like uh, Chris just mentioned, I bring you greetings from Community Bible Church in Vallejo. In many ways, I, we consider this church like a sister church because we have common roots. Uh, Tony Sinelli, your pastor, is such a blessing, and I'm jealous for you because you get to sit under his teaching all the time. He was been one of my heroes growing up, just instrumental in not only the, my development spiritually, but also in the development of our church life. You know, uh, we had Grace School of Theology and all the camps and conferences we've done, and even now as he teaches at the Cornerstone Bible College and Seminary. It's a blessed partnership, and uh, you guys are dear saints to us. Uh, I praise God for Chris. I understand, uh, unfortunately, you're moving away. Um, but I guess God is calling you and Christine to something new and different. So, uh, you know, I look back in, with fondness of the many, many years we got to serve together. And I wish you Godspeed, my friend, as you go on to a, a new adventure. I also praise the Lord for uh, Michael, who, uh, you know, I, I remember running around as a little kid in... Uh, student ministries. Now he's just one of the leaders of this church and even teaching Greek and doing things like that. So it's just an awesome blessing and seeing how God works, you know, among his people. And even Jeff uh, Soliva, he and I were playing music together. And anyway, such dear, dear saints, dear partnerships. And I, I, I pray that uh, you would just feel the warmth of our church upon you and, as well. And you would share in that. So uh, today we're going to be in a short but sweet text. It's Psalm 117. So please open your Bible to Psalm 117. <clears throat> and we're going to read this together. And then I'll pray. Psalm 117 reads, this is God's word. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. You notice I had to read that with some enthusiasm, right? Because uh, uh, it's very rare that you see exclamation points in your Bible. But uh, you can see why the exclamation points are there. Because of the amazing reality of these, this text. So before we d dive into this, let me, let me just ask the Lord for his blessing upon this time. Father God, I thank you for Grace Church and the privilege of me um, being here. I just want to pray for your spirit as we just sang to be working in all of, all of our hearts, work in my mouth and empower me to speak your truth and work in the hearts of those, uh, us who listen to receive and to obey the truth that you give us. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. May you just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I don't know about you, but when Jesus talks about the road being narrow to the way of life, doesn't it feel like the road is getting more narrower and narrower and narrower as time goes on? You know, and Jesus told us as Christians to go out into the world and preach the gospel to all nations. And in this culture that we live in, this, is, this, is, this command can make any man or woman feel a little bit timid because of the, the flavor of the culture, is it not? Because um, this text is literally telling us Christians to praise the Lord among all peoples and all nations. But if you notice, sometimes the smallest things make the biggest impact. Like, for example, this morning, I woke up with a splitting headache. But I, I reached out for a small little pill of ibuprofen. I popped it, and a few minutes later, I felt pretty good. <laughs> or what about the cell phone in your pocket? How, never in history has something so small served to make such a great impact worldwide, right? Well, this psalm is like that. It is tiny, but it has large impact. This, is a, this psalm touches um, all nations, all peoples, for all eternity, speaking of God's eternal qualities. I mean, this psalm is amazing it's 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 glorious if donald trump were to be talking about it he'd say this psalm is huge <laughs> it's the best psalm of all time <laughs> i mean this is this is the shortest psalm but far from insignificant um it's the shortest psalm the shortest chapter in the bible 
Uh, and uh, one commentator said, the shortest Psalm, 117, proves to be one of the most potent and seminal Psalms. It's great and faith, and its reach is enormous. Johnny Mack, or John MacArthur, says in his study Bible, its profundity far outreaches its size. Indeed, this is true because only in two verses we see the psalmist provoke the worship of God among all peoples, among all nations, for all time. This psalm is universal in scope and eternal in duration. And it touches upon the deepest and most important themes in all the scripture. Also interesting to note that of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible, this happens to be the center chapter. Now, whether or not God intended that to be, you know, there for some significance, we don't know. But really, it doesn't matter because what the content of this psalm is central to God's heart. Because it talks about God's glory and among all the nations. So now, because Psalm 117 is all about exalting Christ to the glory of God, and this glory must be spread to all nations, it's definitely central to God's heart. But as I mentioned earlier... The call to proclaim God's glory worldwide can sometimes make us feel squeamish because we live in a culture that is against this. This is um, a call for every person in this world, regardless of borders, language, culture, to worship one God. Not exactly a politically correct message today. But nonetheless, we trudge forward here and dig into some details. Let's make some observations about this psalm, okay? Okay. Now, this psalm is technically considered one of the Hallel psalms because of the first word in the psalm is the Hebrew verb Hallel, which means to give praise to. And there are many Hallel psalms in the Bible, uh, 113 to 118 are some of them. There are some other ones um, that are traditionally um, called Hallel psalms. And these, these psalms have been recited amongst the Jewish uh, people for centuries and they're even sung today on special holidays such as um, Hanukkah and Passover. Now, these Hallel Psalms share the same basic structure. There's a, a, com- a command to praise. There's a reason for those praise, that praise. And then a renewed call to praise. And Psalm 117 matches this pattern exactly. It's exemplary of this pattern. So if we look at 117 from a wide-angle lens... We see the the structure of the psalm is very simple. You have two commands in verse 1, and then you have two reasons to obey those commands in verse 2. In verse 1, you have commandment number 1, praise the Lord, all nations. Commandment number 2 is extol the Lord, all ye peoples. And then the the two reasons that we are given for those commands is number 1, his steadfast love, or hesed, is great toward us. And then the second reason given to obey that command is his faithfulness, or truth, depending on your translation, endures forever. So structurally, this psalm is very, very simple. But thematically, it's on on the surface level, it's not quite so simple. This psalm actually creates a bit of tension, doesn't it? The command for all people in every nation to worship the same God for all time. This is a tall order. I mean, even this, as Christians, there may be a temptation to feel a little embarrassed or squeamish about saying these kinds of things in public. But I'd like to propose and give you this psalm so that you would be encouraged and inflamed to proclaim the glory of God even more as you consider the themes that are in this psalm. Because of the universal glory of God, we must not weaken but strengthen our efforts to preach Christ into this dark culture. As the night becomes increasingly darker, as Ephesians says, we need to be children of light. And so this morning, I'd like to offer you three commands that will help you to be that child of light, to proclaim God's glory into this culture. And three words to remember are heed, understand, and rejoice. Point number one. If you want to carry God's glory out to the nations, you must heed the universal call to worship the Lord. Heed the universal call to worship the Lord. Verse one, once again, 
begins with a command to praise the Lord. Now, this word to praise, once again, hallel, it's where we get the word hallelujah. And the text literally says, hallelujah to Yah. And Yah is an abbreviation for the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Now, Hallel, well, every time you sing hallelujah, you're saying give praise to the God of Israel, not just some generic God. We're talking about the God, the only true God. The God of this universe is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. That's what we're talking about here, who we're talking about here. So when you say hallelujah, you're invoking that, that, that truth. And so praising God involves boasting. I mean, as I did a word study, it's pretty cool thinking about this word. To praise something means to boast in, to, to literally shine the glory of something, to magnify, to exalt, to, to boast about, to even hail. I mean, these words are inherently worship words, right? When you boast about something and you brag about something, inherently that truth about your bragging about, the, th- the object that you're bragging about, is something that you feel deeply about. Like, oh man, I saw this movie, it's so great, you gotta go see it. Or wow, I just ate at that Brazilian steakhouse over there, and I ate like five, six pounds of meat. <laughs> you gotta go try it. <laughs> it's something you're excited about. It, it's inherently emotional. It's inherently, there's ex- inherent excitement. Why? Because The Psalms are filled with songs, right? I mean, it's rare that you're so happy about something that you burst out in song like some musical, right? But that's exactly what the Psalms call us to do. And you think, oh, I'm not that kind of person. Well, yes, you are. I mean, remember the last time you went to that rock concert and you were jumping up and down and screaming the words of that song? Or maybe the last time you were at the Warriors game and you painted your face blue and wore blue and gold and you're like yelling and screaming at the top of your lungs? Well, that, my friend, is a form of little tiny form of worship, is it not? Because you're giving praise to the players on the court or giving praise and glory to the person who's playing guitar or singing, whatever. We all understand what praise and worship is. Worship leads to exaltation. And, you know, worship is actually completed and made even more real when you share it with somebody. We tend to share the things that deeply satisfy us and make us happy, amen? Because we want them to share in the happiness that we have. This is what the psalmist is commanding us to do, to praise Yahweh the Lord. Now, this is an act of worship, and you might think, how could we call a world who doesn't even believe in God to worship our God? Well... The problem of mankind is not that he does not worship. The problem with mankind is that he worships the wrong thing, right? Everybody worships. Even those who claim they don't believe in God, they worship something because they live and praise something that is outside of themselves that they give much glory to. In 2005 at Kenyon College in Ohio, the late author, American author, David Foster Wallace delivered what was considered to be the greatest American college commencement speeches of all time. Now, I usually hate college graduations. Like, I, I'm a student ministry pastor, and, uh, you know, whenever they give the speeches, I tend to leave and then come back for the ceremony because they're long and boring. But this guy said something really amazing. He says this, quote, the only thing that's capital T true in life is that you get to consciously decide what is the what has meaning and what doesn't. In other words, you get to decide what to worship. Because here's something else that is true. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. You see, even this man who was not a Christian was admitting that there are no such thing as atheists because we all worship something ultimate, whether it be the environment or politics or, uh, you know, something else, we worship something. And you are, in fact, a slave to that which you worship. Just because you go to, don't go to church doesn't mean you don't worship. But the psalmist says here that there is only one name worthy of true worship, and that is our Lord God. But what Lord are we talking about, right? 
This name, as you notice in your Bible, it's all uppercase. And you probably know that that means it, it's referring to the proper name of God. The Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H in English uh, letters. Just as you have a proper name, and that name usually has a meaning, God has given his people a proper name. Now, this proper name is amazing. This name speaks of God's character and quality, specifically his eternal existence. One of the key parts of the Bible where we see God's name described is Exodus chapter 3. In verse 14, the context is Moses sees a bush, and the bush is on fire, but the bush is not being consumed. And he says, what's this? So he goes over there, and God sort of pulls out his ID card and tell him, tells Moses who he is. He says this, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name from generation to generation. So the name Yahweh is tied to God's eternal quality. The fact that he could say, I am. All of us on earth could say, I was. I was born on this day, and I'm going to die on this day. But God is the eternal I am. Eternally existent forever, and eternally will exist forever. That's why Jesus is, was, and is, and is to come. Amen? Amen. So this name also um, invokes God's covenant love to us. To Israel, this name was very special. Now, everybody I know, if whoever is married in here probably has a cute little pet name you call your spouse, right? Like Honey Bunny or, or maybe, I don't know. I call my wife Lovely. Okay, that's my little name for her. Well, Israel would look at this name, the name of God, and be comforted because that name signified his covenant love to them. Consider in the group, uh, uh, the, the verse uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, uh, God tells us that he chose Israel not because they were greater in number or greater than the other nations. He says, no, in fact, you were the smallest no nation. But I chose you. I chose to exhibit my love, covenant love to you because I love you. That's essentially what he said. I love you because I love you. Not because you were great or you deserved it, but because I sovereignly chose you, Israel, to exhibit my chesed love upon you. So this is a special name. Now, this psalm is telling to people to praise the Lord, but who is he telling to praise the Lord? Well, it says here, all nations. Now, this word has a connotation of geographic regions, like countries. I think the equivalent today would be like when we say Japan, Israel, you know, Germany, Indonesia. These are ge geographic territories which we call nations. If the psalmist uh, was referring to these, in, in, the psalmist was referring to geographic locations here, it's praise the Lord, all nations. But he adds that not only all countries and territories are called to praise Yahweh, the God of Israel, but all peoples. This second word here is a word that indicates tribes and people groups. Okay, so people groups. Now, the ethnic groups of the world are different from the national identities, correct? Like, for example, um, my parents come from the Philippines, and in the Philippines there are hundreds of dialects and provinces. Even though they're all Filipino, they actually take pride in their own ethnic identity as uh, different language speakers and different people groups even within the Philippines. Even in the United States, we have like different nations even within our nation, like the Cherokee Nation, for example. This is the type of word that's being spoken about here, that even, not just all countries around the world, but even the nations, the people groups within those countries are called to praise the God of Israel. This is, this is huge. 
Now, this is not unusual either. I mean, this is, this is um, something Israel was always called to do. If you recall, when Exodus was saved out of Egypt and taken to the Mount, Mount Sinai, where there's this huge volcano and God is about to tell them why he saved them, well, he says this in 19.5 of Exodus, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, the whole earth is mine, all the nations, all the people, you're going to be my representatives to everybody, all these nations. And in fact, if you reflect this into the New Testament, uh, when we go to First Peter, it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And even if you were to follow that into the book of Revelation, you see that people are gathered around the throne and they're worshiping the Lamb of God saying, praise be to him who, who died for a people of every nation and tribe and tongue. So this is a thread that goes throughout the Bible, starting with Israel, con um, continued and completed in the church for all eternity. This psalm is touching upon the biggest theme of the entire Bible. And it's our task as Christians to be representative of that, of God, to be God's very representatives to all the nations of the earth. What does it say? We are ambassadors for Christ. As go, God, we're entreating through us, be reconciled to God. Now, this, this is, a, like I said, a tall order. It's not politically correct. I mean, when you tell people at your work or your school or your college, especially, that there's only one God and there's only one way to God, it's the equivalent of just putting your fingernails on a chalkboard and just scratching it down really slow for people, right? They hate to hear that kind of stuff. It is not... It is not favorable to the ears of prideful man, is it not? So does that mean we're supposed to like weaken and just kind of step back and say, well, it's good for you, it's good for you, it's good for me, good for me, you know? No. This leads to our second command. And then number two, not only are we supposed to heed God's command to worship him in all nations, but to understand why God's glory must be universal. Number two, understand why God's glory must be universal. Verse two, it starts with the word for. So the word for refers back to verse one, which is explaining um, the command to exalt God in every nation. And then he gives reasons why, two reasons. Number one is his loving kindness is great toward us. Now, the word loving kindness there could be translated as mercy or, uh, in your Bible. This is a special word. It's a, it's a word that appears many times. It's one of the most special words in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word that's pronounced chesed, and it means covenant-keeping, unconditional love. It, it's sometimes translated as loving kindness. In the Greek version of the Old, Te of the, uh, Old Testament, it is translated as mercy or pity. The Net Bible translated as beautifully as loyal love. So this beautiful word speaks of committed, unconditional, fiercely dedicated covenant love. It's the kind of love that a husband should have for a wife and a wife should have for a husband. It's covenantal. And like I said, this, the, in Deuteronomy 7, was, it's very characteristic of this love. The Lord did not set his hesed on you because you were more in number, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath in which he swore to your forefathers. God's love and dedication to Israel is like the love of a, a husband, a jealous husband to a wayward wife who pulls her back. Now, there's even something else here that the English doesn't quite convey in this uh, translation. God's chesed love, where it says is great, it's a verb that means prevail over. It's the same verb that's used in um, Genesis when the floods of water prevailed over the earth and covered everything. This is the, the flood of the, the rains just prevailed on the whole earth. Well, that's God's love toward us. Wow. You know, God's love overwhelms us. I love the NET translation, which says, God's loyal love towers over us. Wow, what poetic language. Now, this is, this is 
the first reason we are to praise Yahweh. But the second reason given is the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Now, this word faithfulness is also a beautiful word. It has a range of meaning, but the, the definition is something like sureness, um, reliability, um, faithfulness, even truth. If you have the NASB or King James, it's going to be translated as truth. And I believe it has more of an emphasis on truth um, because it's translated more as truth in, in most of the Old Testament. And if you think about it, they're not at, faithfulness and truth are not at odds with one another. There's a very close relationship with faithfulness and truth. Um, because the relationship is that because the Lord is true, he is also faithful. Because if you are true and you are eternal and you never change, then you can always keep your promises. You see, God is the ultimate reality. God is ultimate truth. He is the ultimate reality that never changes for all eternity. And if we say something is true, it is only true because God has made it true. Or God says it's true. Truth is not defined by what we say is true or what we feel is true or we say it's true for me. No, truth is only defined if God says it's true. Something is true and only in comparison to God's absolute truth. And because God is eternally unchanging or we say immutable, he can be faithful. So there is a close relationship between faithfulness and truth. So let's talk a moment for about truth, about truth, because this is a huge topic today. To, uh, you know, used to say that this culture was postmodern. Well, that's passe now. Then they said it's post-Christian, right? Well, that's even passe now too. It's now called a post-truth society, where whatever is what we what, what has happened in our culture is that. We have traded that which is objective for that which is subjective. In other words, what is true is determined not by facts, but by feelings now. That is literally the, the mantra that this culture is operating on. If you feel something is true, then it's true. And not only that, it's true for you, but it must be true for me too. And if I don't acknowledge the truth that you feel is true, then I'm oppressing you. Is that not the culture we live in? That's why the road is becoming more narrow. I have to live by you and you and you and you, whatever you consider is true. Man, that's a tall order right there. But listen, something is not defined as true because of man's opinion. No. Something is true because God says it's true. God's truth is everlasting. It never, ever Changes because God never ever changes. You have to let that sink into your head. Because, by definition, if there is a such thing as truth, and there is, then that truth is rock solid, it's objective, and it will remain the basis of what's true. In fact, God is known as the God of truth. Isaiah 65 16 says, Because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth. In other words, even in our courtrooms today, when somebody says, I swear, you know, they put their hand on the Bible, which is pretty interesting. I don't know if they still do that. But the reason they can swear and make an oath is because they're founding it on the God of truth. That I'm going to, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me, God. Right? So even today, we still have that culture. It's built in. God can never, ever be corrected. He is blameless justified in everything he says. Mankind is not the judge of God. God is the judge of man. And so if you say, I don't believe in God because God would never be like this, he would never send people to hell, he would never allow evil to exist, how can your puny mind, uh, which is only like six inches wide or whatever, be the judge of all that is real in this universe? How can your puny eyes be the ultimate judge of what is reality? How arrogant, what hubris we have as humans, right? That whatever I think is right, that's what's got to be right. Man, that's, the, that's sin. S-I-N. 
You know, the middle letter of sin is I, <laughs> right? And that's the nature of sin, is it not? Where I get to say what's right. I get to live my life that way. You know, the old Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. That's the song of On the Way to Hell. I like the song, by the way. I'm not, he was a great artist, really. I do listen to Frank Sinatra. He's great. But... The world denies this, does it not? I mean, as Pilate said when Jesus was being uh, interrogated by him, what is truth? What is truth anyway? It's the same question we ask today. People are being encouraged to live in a reality that they create for themselves. What they're telling our children today is this phrase, you need to live out your true self. I hear that message so many times now. Or how about this? You need to be true to yourself. If you watch Disney Channel 24 hours a day, it's follow your heart. Be true to yourself. Well, I'll tell you what, that is a fairy tale. Because if you follow your heart, it's going to lead you into a ditch. You're going to destroy your life if you follow your heart. Why? Because our hearts are deceitful, wicked, right? Who can understand them? Their hearts are darkened. Our minds are darkened. We're broken. We're we're sinful. Our hearts are naturally bent away from God. But praise God that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And he lived the perfect life without sin. So that in Christ, if we believe in him, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, we can be made new. And we can be resurrected and be and fix the broken nature of our hearts that are darkened. And now, when you get saved, all of a sudden, the light bulb turns on. Can you relate? Can any of you relate to that? When you opened the Bible for the first time, and you got saved, all of a sudden, the words just jumped out on the page, right? I remember reading the Gospel of John for the first time. I was like, wow, I felt like my eyes were as big as saucers. And I was riveted. Before, when I got saved, the Bible was this giant book at the end of the hallway. Nobody touched it. I felt like if I touched it, it would be like Indiana Jones, you know, where the thing comes out and then everybody's face melts and stuff. I never would touch the Bible because I thought it was too holy for me. But man, God saved me. And all of a sudden, I understand the words of the Bible. I've never read it before in my life. That's the Holy Spirit breaking the bonds, the, 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 the veil that's over people's hearts, right? And all of a sudden, what used to be foolishness is now the best thing ever. That's God's truth. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Amen. That's why you're here today. That's why you're in this building. Because God has changed your life. And he's given you new eyes to see his truth. I mean, man, really, we live in the the era of fake news, don't we? Where every, even your grandma has a blog. And talking about this or that on the internet. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, whatever political party you're talking about gets to issue out their news version of the news. And, you know, there's, there's this term we call fake news. Oh, that guy has fake news. They have fake news. Well, and then they have these things called fact checkers, right? Well, who gets to check the fact checkers and tell them what is true, right? Well, I'll tell you who. God. There's only one person who could tell you who, what is true, and it's God. God is true. As Paul says, let God be true and let every man be found a liar. God's truth is objective. It is unchanging. It stays true forever and ever and will remain the basis for what is true. So unlike what our culture says, God defines what is right and wrong. So there is universal truth and it comes from a universal God. And this kind of creates a tension, right? It creates a tension because there is a biblical war on truth, isn't it? If you think about all the attacks that we see in our culture today, they're not attacking Buddhism or Hinduism or even Islam. I mean, Islam makes some pretty exclusive claims, don't they? Right? They're not attacking them. Who are they attacking? Well, you know, you can find out what is true when you find out what the thing that they're attacking the most. It's biblical Christianity. Make no mistake. Biblical Christianity is the target of this culture. Why? Because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is the battle. And you guys are the targets. It's a war of information. 
It's a war of truth. That's why the Bible says, renew your mind. Romans 12, right? Or we take every, and in 1 Corinthians, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does it say? Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to read the Bible, friends. You need truth in your heart, in your mind. If you don't have this coursing through your veins, you're going to get duped by what the culture is calling their truth. But the struggle is real, man. I'll tell you. I kind of like backed off social media because like literally, if you make a statement that would be totally uncontroversial a couple years ago, like a man is a man and a woman is a woman. You say that now? Oh my goodness. Get ready for such hate and vitriol and venom that will pour down upon you like fire from, he- from you know where. Okay? <laughs> I mean... If you put that on your social media, you could get hate mail, you could get canceled, you could even lose your job. There have been people who've lost their job because they've posted one thing like that. I remember Manny Pacquiao, the boxer, you know, he's sponsored by Nike, and they asked him his opinion on LGBT, he just gave his opinion. And next thing you know, Nike cancels him. Million, million of dollar contract. He was the best pound for pound boxer in the world at that time, but because they didn't agree with his opinion, sorry. So, man, this, the stakes are high, isn't it? You could literally lose your job for posting um, something like marriages between one man and one woman, period. You post that on your social media, beware. So you got to be wise as serpents or innocent as doves, don't you? Paul Washer writes this. We live in a culture where the devil has taken off his mask to parade in the streets in broad daylight. Immorality is now considered virtue, and biblical virtue is now considered immorality. Indeed, that is true. Morally speaking, we live in the upside-down Alice in Wonderland world, right? I mean, I, 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 I can't believe how fast things have decayed. We're just in a few years we are actually trying to figure out what is a woman. We can't even figure that out anymore. No one's willing to answer that question. But I tell you what, this movement is just another form of oppression of women, is it not? It's an attack on the family. God's designed for the family. God's designed for marriage. God's designed for, um, you know, humanity. It's nothing new under the sun. In the garden, God, uh, uh, the serpent says... Didn't God say, you know, you'll be like gods? Well, that's exactly what people want to do now. They're their own God. So these statements that you need to worship one God, it's very inflammatory today. But think about this. Those statements about women and, you know, marriage, that's actually small compared to the statement that the psalmist is making. There is only one God of all nations, of all peoples, and you need to worship him alone. That's the big one right? Don't worry about these. I mean, this is just on the side. This is the big issue right here because whatever you believe about marriage and all that stuff, if you don't believe that there is one God and there is only one way to God, nothing else matters. It's an eternal destiny you're talking about. It's either heaven or hell. It's binary, friends. (laughs) It's not a spectrum. Heaven, hell, black or white, you know what I mean? That's the gospel, God deals with the binary, doesn't he? I don't even like using that term because it's, it's just, you know, whack. But <laughs> should we Christians give up because our culture is so, you know, hateful towards Christianity? Should we give up? Should we, like, cower in, in the background and say, you know, let's just gather in our holy huddle, stay in church, do my thing, you know, all this stuff. No. This psalm is commanding us, all nations from all people everywhere, to worship the living God. So if anything, we need to strap on the sword, run into the battlefield, get into the front lines, and start swinging. That's what we need to do, friends. That's what you need to do. Even though you're not a missionary or a pastor, if you're just a student at a school, or you're a mother training your kids, no matter what your situation is, you need to wield the sword. Don't be 
weak, and may God help us not to be weak. I mean, don't we yield the truth, my friends? We're the ones that have the truth, not them. You should have utter confidence when you go to talk to somebody about Christ and you talk to somebody about the gospel. When you tell somebody they need to repent and believe in Christ, you are actually telling them the right thing. It is the truth, the only truth. Oh, that sounds so hateful. You can't say that. That's what it says right here. Praise the Lord, all nations. Worship him, all peoples. Now that leads to our third and final command. I know it is kind of, it make, you feel kind of timid talking to people of this world about these truths, but I want you to be encouraged. That's my third point. You need to rejoice because in Christ, God's universal call to worship can be fulfilled in all the nations. In other words, how can we legitimately tell all nations and peoples to worship Christ? It's because of Jesus Christ. How's that work? Well, look at this where it says, his faithfulness, um, great is his steadfast love toward, what does it say? Us. Now, when this was written, who's the us talking about? It's talking about Israel, right? So here's the question. Why would all nations and peoples of the Gentile world praise the Lord if God's love was only directed towards us, his covenant people, the nation of Israel? It would seem strange and even selfish and hateful if Israel were to command praise among the Gentiles if God's love was only for them, right? How could Israel expect all nations to give praise to Yahweh because God's loving kindness to his people results in my exclusion and God's truth results in my judgment, you see? How can we as Gentiles joyfully obey the command of Psalm 117? Well, the answer lies in the New Testament, Romans 15. Take a look at this. Now, Romans 15, we have a situation where Christianity has just burst onto the scene in Rome. And people from all ethnicities were being saved left and right. You had a, a religion... Uh, of Judaism that was there for like thousands of years, right? And, all, and, th and throughout that time, they were told not to sort of intermingle with the nations. But all of a sudden, the church is bursting at the seams and there's Gentiles sitting in the same worship center as the Jews. And the Jews are like, wow, I'm not sure if I should be with you, okay? You're, you're from another ethnicity. And so there was actually some racism in the early church, and, um, you know, Paul's, Paul has a solution. And he turns in verse, and look at Romans 15, verse 7. What does he tell Israel to do about these other ethnicities that are in the church? He says, therefore, welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. So this is awesome. Let me just stop right there, because this world, you know what their solution to racism is? This world is supposedly trying to fix racism. They, they tried to fix racism by, by further categorizing us into races. And the term race, I don't even use that term. Race is an artificial term because we're all one race, the human race, right? We're all different ethnicities, cultures. Um, and so they try to fix racism by more racism. It's like you have been the, the oppressor. Now you're going to become the oppressed. That's how we're going to fix this. It's a power struggle. That's their, the world's form of fixing racism. No, there's a better solution. Look, it says, verse 7, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the circumcised, that is, the Jews, to show God's truthfulness. Same word as Psalm 117. In order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Same word. Truth and mercy. Grace, truth. As it is written, then this is awesome, okay? I get excited about this. Right here, Paul shows his mastery of the Bible by quoting, you know, you ever see Paul, he weaves like all these Old Testament texts together in like one sentence? He does this right here. Look what he says. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing your name. That comes from 2 Samuel 22. 
Again, he says, verse 10, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That comes from Deuteronomy 32, 43. And then again, guess where this comes from? Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Psalm 117. Verse 12, again, Isaiah says, now he quotes Isaiah, There shall come the root of Jesse, and who arises to rule over the Gentiles? In him, Jesus, all the Gentiles will hope. You see this? The reason why all, uh, we can fulfill the commands of Psalm 117 that all nations and uh, uh, peoples praise the name of the Lord is because Jesus Christ died for all the nations. And it's only in Jesus Christ that the fulfillment of Psalm 117 could come to fruition. And it's because of Jesus Christ that we can openly and freely and with great power proclaim God's forgiveness and salvation to all the world. It's wonderful. This is an amazing thing. God's plan of redemption has always included Gentiles as, promise, as he promised to bless the nations even from um, Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant. You will be a blessing to all the nations, right? In you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So how can we as Christians call the nations of the world to be unified under one banner? It's the hesed and truth of God has come to the nations through our Lord Jesus Christ. It even says in John chapter 1, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were given through Jesus Christ. So you have the grace, the hesed, and you have the truth of, of God given to the world through Jesus Christ. Wow. And that's the gospel, my friends. So yes, welcome one another. Christianity gives the only solution to racism, right? That's the only solution. We're not to, like, subscribe to all the social justice mantras of critical theory to fix racism. I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. It's probably better called partiality, right? But the gospel breaks down those barriers, does it not? Because in heaven... There's not going to be a Korean section of heaven <laughs> or the Chinese section of heaven. It's going to be heaven. It's going to be one people raising their hands from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, raising their hands, worshiping Christ. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Yes. And it's going to be a joyful day. You know, as Christians, we have the command to go into this world and say, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be what? Saved. This world needs saving, right? It needs saving big time. And it goes on to say in that text, Romans uh, 10, 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bounding in riches for all who call on him. Forever who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jew, Greek, whatever slave free, whatever you're into, if you surrender to Christ today, God can change your heart and you will be saved. So Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Psalm 117. So my friends, as we go into the world and try to fulfill the commission that God has given us, be encouraged. As we look back at the last phrase of the text of Psalm 117, the last phrase is a repetition of verse 1. It just simply says, praise the Lord. When you share, don't share the gospel under obligation. You share out of joy. You share out of the, the riches of that halal praise that comes from a heart that's been redeemed. You know, you're trying to tell people where to get the good stuff. You know, God is the fountain of all delight. We're not here just telling people, you better good, repent to turn, turn to Christ or you're going to go to hell. It's not fire insurance we're selling. We're selling the whole thing like this is true life abundant life. I came that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. Think about this, man. God is the source of all delight, all joy, all perfect things. Every perfect gift is, comes from above the Father of lights from whom there was no variation or shifting shadow. Anything good that you enjoy, friendship, love, food, you know, all these things that we enjoy, guess who it comes from? It comes from God. The best thing that could ever happen to a human being is they get re reunited with their creator because you could have all the riches in this world, but if you don't know God, you got nothing. 
You got nothing. Because when you die, it's all gonna, some other person's just going to inherit your stuff. And what the worst thing that can happen to you is like you, you live this whole life and you, 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 know, you, you amass to the top. You, know, you made it to the top. You're rich. You're famous. Whatever. You got cars. You got mansions. And then you die and go to hell. What a tragedy that would be. Because you didn't know the, the, your creator. You didn't give the glory to the one who created you. Well, my friends, if you're not there, then you can be there today, this morning. If you're not in Christ, obey the words of this psalm. Just say, praise the Lord. I want to praise you, Lord. I want to give you the glory that, is, that I'm supposed to give you with my life. I want to surrender. And if you're a Christian and you already know this great love, then share it. Not just share it, proclaim it. Proclaim it with great joy. Proclaim it with more enthusiasm than when you're jumping up and down at the Warriors game or at that rock concert or when you got that promotion at work or you won the lotto. And by the way, if you won the lotto, um, I'll give you my number. Let's hang out. (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father God, I thank you for these dear group of saints. I could tell that this truth resonates in their hearts because we have been changed and we have ultimate joy through Jesus Christ who has saved us from our sin. He's taken the blinders off our eyes so that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for the one who died for us and gave his life for us and not just to save us from hell, but to give us the greatest delight and joy that we could ever have. God, you're so good to us. That is why we can sing out and say, Hallelujah! God, you are great. Oh, encourage us this week. Whatever we're doing, whether we need to go to college classes or school, um, workplace that is oppressive, or whatever we're doing this week, help us. Help us to just glorify you the way that is being written here in this psalm. We want to give you the praise that is due, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.